Hi, hello everyone, um, and welcome. It's wonderful to see you all here tonight. Um, my name is Shalini Legal. Uh, I'm the chief curator and the Susan Denell and Harry W. Conkel Curator of European Art, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, as we've all gathered here, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that this place, the Portland Museum of Art, occupies land in the land of the dawn that was and still is inhabited by the Wabanaki peoples, including the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations in what is known today as Maine. I'm delighted to see so many of you here tonight uh, as we open our exhibition, Kathy Butterly, One Out of Many Headscapes. This exhibition has been organized by the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis and is generously support, supported by David Charak II, the Girlfriend Fund, Ted Rowland, Anonymous, Carrie Shapiro and Peter Frey, Elizabeth Levine, and the Maxine and Stuart Frankel Charitable Foundation. Thank you also to our ASL interpreters from Pine Tree Society for joining us tonight, Merrill Troop and Fred McKinley. I would also like to thank the many lenders to the exhibition who are with us tonight and acknowledge my former colleague, Jamie DeSimone, who unfortunately was not able to be here tonight but was here earlier today to see the show. Um, Jamie initiated this collaboration with the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis and with Kathy and Lisa, and we're so excited to be able to share this show with our audiences here in Maine. Tonight's conversation will last approximately 45 minutes with time after for a brief Q&A. Uh, Kathy Butterly, out of one many headscapes, presents over three decades of the artist's small-scale ceramic sculptures. Butterly describes herself as a painter who happens to work in clay. With years of experience with porcelain and using hundreds of glazes, she has extraordinary command of form and color, and it has been such a pleasure and an honor, Kathy, to see you at work during the exhibition installation this week. Um, as you've all seen or will see after the talk, um, Kathy Butterly works on a domestic and intimate scale, pushing each of her ceramic sculptures to the limit of its material possibilities. It's a painstaking process of firing porcelain, a medium that can be both luscious and unforgiving, and the final results are just breathtakingly beautiful and leave us wanting to see more and know more about what we're seeing. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Kathy Butterly and Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis Executive Director and Exhibition Curator Lisa Melandry, who will be in conversation this evening. Kathy splits her time between New York City and Maine, and for the past 30 plus years, her sculptures have focused on using the vessel form as her, mu as her muse. She received her MFA from UC Davis, California, 1990 and her BFA from the Moore College of Art Philadelphia. Kathy has been the recipient of numerous awards, most notably the 2014 Guggenheim Fellowship Award, 2009 Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant, and the 2002 Anonymous Was a Woman Grant, and her works are in the collection of numerous museums, including the Whitney, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, MFA Boston, and the Portland Museum of Art. Um, her work is represented by James Kahn in New York City, and Lisa Melandry, the Executive Director of the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis, leads the region's premier contemporary non-collecting art institution since joining CAM, the Contemporary Art Museum, in 2012. Lisa has brought both emerging and established artists from around the globe to St. Louis, presenting art that is always innovative, provocative, and relevant. During her tenure, she's organized a wide array of exhibitions and projects that have delivered on her vision of expanding access to contemporary art. As a curator, she's continued to organize outstanding exhibitions such as Micheline Thomas, Mentors, Muses, and Celebrities, Racing Cars, uh, sorry, Salvatore Scarpita, Racing, Racing Cars, Sanford Biggers, Christine Corday, Relative Points, and of course, Kathy Butterly, Out of One Many Headscapes. Under her leadership, Cam has become one of St. Louis's most welcoming and stimulating living rooms, I love that description, um, where art is free for all. Prior to joining CAM, Lisa was deputy curator for exhibitions and programs at the Santa Monica Museum of Art, and has she has degrees from Harvard University and the Williams College graduate program. Please join me in welcoming Kathy and Lisa. Hi. Hello. Can you hear us? OK. <laughs> well, first, um, I just want to say thank you so much to the PMA, to the Portland Museum of Art. It is truly thrilling to see this gorgeous exhibition in a new space, in a new light. It's kind of a new chapter. 
And um, the first thing that we'll talk about is that this is actually two exhibitions put together. And here, in this space, they really do talk to each other, these two different bodies of work. Um, I also very much want to say thank you to the lenders and the donors that made this show possible. There's a lot of work in this show and a lot of lenders from across the country who very, very generously parted with their works, not only for the CAM exhibition, but for here. So I just want to say thank you so much. And to all the staff here for their wonderful work in organizing the show. So just a preamble. But I do want to start with this idea that you, know, you have the show out of one many and headscapes. And it was really conceived as a single exhibition with these two distinct parts. And I thought that would be a wonderful place to start for you to talk a little bit about what are these two different bodies of work and why are they both separate but complementary? How are they like a foil to one another? Right. Um, I, I also just want to quickly just say what a great experience this has been for me. Um, thank you, Lisa, for inviting me to have an exhibition and then for the PMA to um, take it. It, it. It's just like amazing. So I'm so grateful and thank you everybody who made this happen. Um, so <clears throat> when Lisa approached me um, and said, I have this idea, I have two spaces, what do you want to do? And I was <laughs> like, huh, two spaces, well, you know, maybe two distinct um, bodies of work would work. And one of the spaces was rather small. And I thought, I've always dreamed of having um, my um, cup forms um, all together. So I've been, I've been working on these, what I call cup forms, for over 15 years. And what I mean by cup forms is that um, the works all started from the same um, mold. So I have a pint glass that I made a two-part plaster mold out of, and for 15 years, I was using the same form over and over again. And th this is what I, I call my canvas. So it's my blank, it's my beginning. So it's a, a white piece of clay, same form over and over again, that for about 15 years, I would manipulate and find um, a lot of variation because I'm changing. Through 15 years, you know, I change, the world changes, and um, I, I never got bored, and I, um, I always found that um, there's a lot that can be said in a mere, like, three inches. Yeah. So um, the other distinct body of work is the headscapes, which um, is, well, Lisa, you asked me to make 10 new works for your show. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and, and I did. And you did. And I did. <laughs> and I did. And the idea, um, you know, when I was making the the cup forms for like 15 years, those weren't the only forms I was making for 15 years. I was doing other, um, other forms too, but I really wanted to see them together and see the, the development and the evolution of the same form over and over again and how much variation I could get from them. And I, I liken the way that my approach um, psychologically to them in a way is I have, I have two children. And they came from the same place. They came from me and my husband and my belly. And they're so uniquely different. So my idea is with these cast forms, they all start from the same place. And I, I help, I allow them to get to where they want to be. So that's how I look at them. Like they start off one way and, and I help them get to where they need to be. One of the things too that I will just mention that is so nice in this particular case to have both of these bodies of work together is you know when Kathy talks about using this pint glass form and you know the idea that something in three inches can have can be so iterative can mm -hmm. be so changeable and what's really interesting is that the headscapes are you know we had sort of talked about them as huge right I yeah. mean we're, we'll talk about scale a little <laughs> bit later but I think what's really really interesting is in this installation you really can see that those cup forms are quite small in scale compared. And so it's a wonderful chance to kind of look at, you know, that you went big for yeah. the landscapes. <laughs> it's really interesting. I think what's interesting is like with the cup forms, like I, I, when I'm working on them, I don't 
I don't understand scale because they're huge to me. Because my universe, when I'm making them, I'm right here and I get absorbed into, into them. And so if they're, they could be three inches or 30 inches, I'm so absorbed into them that they, they feel huge and their universes. But when, when I went into the gallery and I'm looking at these, you know, the, the cup forms on the wall, yeah, you could probably fit four of them in one of the larger forms. Yeah. But I also feel like even as small as they are, they hold court <laughs> as, as strongly as a larger form does. Like they, they have the same amount of power or intensity or power of presence as larger pieces do, which was really interesting for me to see. It's really funny, and we can actually look at a couple of them, but this one, like butter, what's really, it's always amazing, right, to see things out of scale in reproduction. And there's that gorgeous super bloom is the piece that is on the, um, the wall vinyl as you walk in, and they are really kind of, you know, present and huge. And then you walk in the gallery, and it is very true that in their real size, they are commanding. And I think that's really interesting. So this is one of the cup forms. Yes, this is like butter. Do you want me to click through a little yeah, bit? Yeah, go, just go, I wanna go to the next one just oh, because. Do I, do I not turn it on? I think I have to do something. Uh-oh, my bad. There we go, there it is. Okay. Oh. So this is the first one. Yes. This is the first cup form. So do you want to, um, I, I want to talk about your process. Mm -hmm. And I think as we're going through and you can see the sort of mind-blowing labor that you are engaged in in these pieces, regardless of the what body of work or what scale or whatever. And I think what happens is when you see these pieces in person, you know, you see this reproduction, you understand that there are all of these different elements, but when you see them in person, you start to realize um, the kind of work that it has taken, not even just the firing, but the actual sculpting and yeah. the additive part of the process. So just two things. First of all, this is the first cup form, mm -hmm. so if you could share a little bit about that and then maybe talk a little bit about this What's slightly insane them? labor. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this um, this is called Spring, and it's it's the very first cup form I made. And I, um, I'm i not somebody who can just give myself an assignment and, and make it and just start a new body of work. So the idea of the cup form was mulling in my head for a long time. For I always think it's like a two-year process of me thinking of something, mulling it over, and trying to figure out how to do it. Um, and I had been wanting to use the, the cup form as like a vehicle for sculpture. And um, it's Ken Price and Con Ron Nagel, like are, you know, I was just so enamored with, with their work, but really drawn towards the, their smallest works, which I, I well, well, Ron's always working small, but um, with Ken's work, I, I really was drawn to the cup forms. And so I wanted to do that too, but I didn't know how to do it. And then Tom, my husband, went up to, uh, I think it was Yale, and there was a show of Mayan ceramics, and they were just, he brought back the, um, the catalog, and I don't know why that opened up my world, but they were just cylinders of um, 360 degrees of um, iconography painted on the outside of the form, and for some reason, then I'm like, all right, I'm doing it. So th that's how it started. You don't know what, is, what, what enables you or me to start something, but it, it was seeing these Mayan cup forms, which are extraordinary and small. I didn't well, know that. Oh, there you go. I just <laughs> learned something. <laughs> and then in terms of the labor, let's see. Um, there we go. Let's, um, so this is another example of, it came from the same form as spring. I think when, when I had spring up there, it was a little bit more obvious, like the form wasn't as, um, as elaborate. Um, this is um, much more carved. So basically how I get to this point is, you know, I cast the form and it's brutal. They're ugly, they're torn, they have holes in them. And it, once I'm, I, I basically start manipulating the clay and then like a three-dimensional Rorschach tech, test, if I see something in it, I'm drawn to it, it has like a personality, I'm like, all right, I, I'm committed to this form. And then I, 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 I work with the clay 
through varying varying like temperatures of like or not temperature but like dryness so I work on the clay when it's wet and I work on it when it's dry but the thing that I never have really stressed too much until now I'm becoming very aware it's important these are highly carved yeah. so they start off rather thick and then they bring them down and the carving is probably one of my favorite parts of the process along with adding the color but it's such a sensual part of the process of building so I'm carving and it's a very slow and intimate process it takes days but it's um, it's so seductive and lovely and um, and I I think um, when I'm carving areas, like I, I always think of this, um, I have to paraphrase it, but it was um, Alice, uh, not Alice Neal, Louise Bourgeois once described those, those beautiful line drawings that she did, like repetitive line drawings that as she's drawing them, she's thinking of combing the hair of someone she loves. And I thought, oh my God, that's such a beautiful way of describing a process. And what I'm reminded of it when I'm carving over and over again, and then I take my wet sponge and I'm, I'm, I'm smoothing areas, and it's, it's a real love affair. And so I love this process, and I fall in love with the piece during this, this time. And then I put it in the kiln and fire it, and, you know, and then I start adding glazes. <laughs> but also these, like, all of the little, whether it's the beads or whether it's these, like, areas of accretion, mm -hmm. You're adding those one by one, piece by piece. Yeah. So that comes at a later point. So there's yeah. also, so not only are you manipulating this form in a really kind of labor intensive and iterative way, but then it's really an additive process. I mean, then you're adorning it. I, I'm, it's totally additive. And so, uh, so to s describe my, my process also is that I, um, I'm a process artist. Like, I do not, when I make a piece, I have no idea what it's going to be about. I have no idea what it's going to look like. It's the, it's the process of making and of adding that um, slowly develops into the meaning of the work. So I can work on a piece for like half a year up to, I've worked on a piece for two years one time. So it's a very slow process. I don't make very, very many works. Like, my, my idea is like, I don't want to put anything out there unless it's like, it's so right. The world has enough stuff. Yeah. We don't need any, it, it, it needs to speak and it needs to, it needs to hold court and have presence. So the way that I can do that is by, through my process of building um, and thinking and, and listening to public radio and <laughs> listening to music, the public radio, listening to the news because it's such a long process yeah you know it's like a six to a year process like the world's changing and i'm changing and the information is going into the work that's changing so the works evolve with what i'm looking at and that also influences the colors and whatnot but what happens is so basically i, I make a piece you know i fire it in the kiln once i add one color and then i add another color and every time i add a color i have to stick it in the kiln so they can be fired anywhere from 15 to like over 30 times. It's brutal. It's, yeah, it's brutal. But um, <laughs> <laughs> it's brutal. But, um, and also when a lot of the work, like if I'm, if I'm carving what I call like a, the, the lines of beads, they're each carved in place with a pin and a dental tool and then they'll fall off. <laughs> you know? So it's, um, it's a very long process, like in some of the works upstairs, you'll see there'll be a line of beads or carved beads, which function on many different levels for me. Like they're not decorative, they actually, they're formal in a way where it brings your eye around. And it's something that pulls you in closer to the work and they manipulate you in a way, like they pull you in closer and you stay longer. But they're also, they have meaning for me, which has changed over time. So, um, Early on, I was like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing these pearls? And they take a very, you know, they start off as, you know, I dot, dot, dot clay on and build it up and then carve it back down each one. So I care about them. Yeah. They're, they're full of like intention and love. And I thought, why am I doing pearls or why am I doing whatever? And then I thought, well, what is a pearl? A pearl starts off as a speck of sand that goes into an oyster or a clam and it's an irritant. 
it's like annoying. And then the clam or the oyster, like to deal with the irritant, it creates something soft and beautiful. And I thought that is such a powerful statement is like to create beauty out of something that's annoying. <laughs> so for me, like I call them my power pearls. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're gracing the outside of this form, like creating this poetic strength, mm -hmm. but also during like COVID when I was working in my studio and like <laughs> just carving strands of these pearl lines all over the pieces, they became worry beads to me. So they take on different meanings. So they're formal, bring your eye around the piece, there's colors, there's an intention to pull you in, but then they have personal meaning for me. So that's a really good kind of segue to talk a little bit about, you know, when we look at these works, we think of them as painterly, sculptural, and abstract. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at the very beginning, you said you were working on the cup forms over 15 years, and you changed, the world changed. Right. And that those are things that actually can be seen in them. And I think one of the kind of keys for the viewer is the titles of the work, that sometimes it can really help you find the moment in which you were making something. And they can be very much about current events. And when we talk a little bit more about the headscapes, I think that there's a lot there about, you know, what is happening now in our world. But there's a lot of that from the very, very beginning with these yes. cup forms. And um, I think this is a perfect example. You know, I'm not sure I trust your eggs. And so if you could just kind of take us through a few of these pieces and share kind of how the formal concept of the work is also really sort of related to content, to yeah. subject, to your experience. Mm -hmm. So this, the, I feel like this is a really important piece for me. Um, and I made it, um, there was a show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art years ago, and it was a show of Mirandi's paintings. And I had gone a few times, and I don't know anybody who doesn't love Mirandi. <laughs> um, and what really struck me by this show was I was really drawn to um, the colors that I normally would not like. Like, I love color. I have no fear of color. <laughs> I love color. And I was, I was just mesmerized by the fact that, like, he took, like, tan, beige, off-white, <laughs> mushroom, <laughs> taupe, mauve, all these colors, and I'm like, ugh, oh, and, and made them so intriguing to me. And I'm like, he makes these colors, which I thought are so boring, he makes them so enticing and exciting. And, um, and so I gave myself an assignment. I, I worked on a body of work, which became a show, um, based on the colors of uh, Mirandi's palette. So um, what I, that was so important to me because what I learned with color and using these restricted palette was nuance. I learned about nuance in my work. So rather than just putting on an orange, now I put on a very complicated buildup of, of colors that talk about orange, but maybe there's really like a brown in there or so the colors became very very complicated thanks to like this assignment that I gave myself and then what I also realized with this assignment and this piece in particular is because of the limited palette I became really aware of the quality of the line within the work so the quality of the line meaning for me the first line in the work is the the outline of the form like the actual, like they became, this piece, like it became like a three dimensional line drawing in space for me because of the limited palette. And I became very aware of the carved lines of the form within and then, you know, adding like some, some brown lines to, to accentuate the, the flow and detail was like a pencil line to me. So I really learned about like not only the nuance of color but variations of line and how line can be a sculpted line or a painted line or a drawn line. So it's super important to me. Yeah. And in terms of the title, I don't think I trust your eggs. Um, I think all my work is like political <laughs> and um, you wouldn't know it. Like that's not my intent. It becomes what it, it becomes through the development and where I am. So I actually made this piece when I was up in Maine and the neighbor up the, the road was um, selling eggs and they were so bright and they were like <laughs> fluorescent orange and they tasted really good. 
And then, you know, I go back to New York and I like, you know, go to the food store and I crack an egg and it's like pale. I'm like, <laughs> well, I don't want to eat that. And I was like, I don't trust your factory farmed eggs, you know? So it's like my little statement, a little statement, that's ridiculous, but it's my statement about, um, you know, form, but also like, where, where does it, what is this piece about? So it also about the eggshell on the outside, yeah. like that really reminded me once again of like these beautiful eggs. So that's, well, the story. <laughs> no, but it's interesting too because the first one that was up like butter. I mean, obviously there are pieces on it yeah. on the top that really do look like pats of butter. Yeah. But that's a pretty Oops, like um there we go. You know, that's so much about the body. Yeah. That's when I fell in love with my husband. It's very juicy. Yeah. <laughs> it's <a> great. <laughs> But that's the other thing is but it's like juicy, what, but it's funny it's, and it's sweet. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. It's, it's sweet a lot, and it's, naughty. Yeah. And yeah. It's all there. And you know, the thing is like, I don't censor myself when I'm working. I like, I had no idea that that is a really insane piece. Like it's I, totally. I, it's intense and it's so, I, I didn't realize that like, you know, it, I, I wasn't guarded when I made it. I just, I, I make what I need to make. Yeah. And I was so in love and it was unfiltered and I just made that piece and, and I own that piece. I love that piece, you know, so it's, yeah. it's like, um, I, I never want to filter. I never want to not make what needs to be, that needed to be made. Yeah. And I, I helped it get there. <laughs> Can you take us to, I think we have November night, yeah. Yeah, now we get dark. <laughs> so um, this piece is called November 9th, and um, when you look at the, the date, it says November 9th, 2017, 17, but it's really about November 9, 2016, and that's the day after Trump was elected. And I, um, this piece the day before was bright blue and pretty colors, and the next day I covered it in black because I was feeling black on the inside and black on the outside and I was just like devastated. And, but I kept, oops, sorry. I kept the, um, the white pearls, my white yeah. power pearls and my pink shoulders. <laughs> so for me, this is like, yeah, it's pretty dark, but like I'm still standing and strong and I'm like, yeah, I'm like, Good fight. <laughs> okay, the last one I'll ask you. Yeah. To look, the next, I think it might be next, is Super Bloom. Yeah. Another one, just if you could kind of go through. So now we're moving yeah. into the headscapes. Different in terms of the overall scale. Totally. Made from a different, either one or two forms. Made from a, a vase from West Elm. Yeah. And so it has this, I mean, they also do, they're small. Yeah. But they do also have a head quality to them, yeah. you know, setting on these bases. It's sort of like the bases in some cases almost become a bit of a pulpit yeah. for the thing to kind of talk from, speak from. Mm -hmm. But this one is particularly squished. <laughs> yeah. So when I... Um... So when we were coming up, I was coming up for the title of the show, Headscapes, I, I, I realized that a lot of my work um, was about like the body or the head. Like I had a, a after 9-11 I made a, um, a, a body of work which was um, really, they were kind of like water towers but like tipped over, they were just heads. And they, um, I lived downtown Manhattan and you know, close to 9-11 and uh, uh, close to the World Trade Center and my, my head was so full of fear, and so all the work became about the head. And so these, again, I'm realizing I go from like body to head, body to head, or, but what also, like this body of work, like headscapes, had to do with head, but also like planets. They really yeah. evolved into like scapes, like, a, like a, a landscape, planetscape. So I really was thinking very much about head and planet and like, get me out of here, you know, <laughs> like, you know, COVID, like, you know, just kind of like a, a mental escapism, I guess. So with this form, um, you know, it started off very large and bulbous and I just carved the piece and allowed it to become this very large head planet, really. 
And when I was, um, as the work was developing, and I was, I was, um, this work went to a show that was in California, and it was when California was having the wildfires, yeah. and um, and I, it, there was a super a super bloom of poppies during the year. So that's where super bloom comes from because it was abnormal. There was the the fields had been burned. And from fires, and there was an abnormal ab amount of poppies being grown the next year. So it was a super bloom, and it was so beautiful and so exciting. But I'm like, that's not normal. Right. Yeah, it's beautiful, but it's beautiful because it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so it's so the work is also like more and more as it's going more from like you know um, like butter, which is a very nude figurative piece, and becoming much more aware of, it's really becoming landscape and environment. That's where the work seems to be going. I want to kind of go backwards in your practice and talk a little bit about scale, scale right. in general. So, okay, we're talking about like, oh my God, this is huge, right? <laughs> this is all a relative discussion. Why? have you decided to be an artist who works small? I mean, I think that, you know, we talked about how even though these works are small, they're commanding, even though, you know, it's a singular piece, it really does function like a world. I mean, as a viewer, you sort of fall into them, but it's a decision. Yeah. It's a decision, and I, and I would say, you know, sometimes you might start a certain way because you have practical concerns. What's the size of your kiln right. or the size of your studio? But this is intentional for you because yeah. it's not always the way that you have worked. Can you just yeah. talk about why? Yeah. So I, um, when I was in undergrad school, I was working extremely large. Um, Viola Fry was my... Um, my the person who opened up my door into working with clay. So Viola Fry's works were what twelve, to yeah. 10, you know, fifteen feet tall, and and I was making works that were like six, seven, eight feet tall, and um, and it was great. I loved it, and um, and then this well, the personal side of the story is which I, I will go into is um, when I went to grad school. I went to UC Davis in California, and my um, my boyfriend of um, over five years, when I, right when I arrived to Davis, he killed himself. And so when I entered school, I, um, you know, I had a lot to deal with. And so I worked. I worked, I worked, I worked, and I was working very large. And it just didn't feel, that wasn't my, who I was anymore. My heart was broken. And um, I felt like I was illustrating. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was, um, describing what I was feeling rather than making the real thing that I needed to make. And so what I felt like, I actually started just processing everything. I started making a few very small forms that were really like the size of my heart and they were heartfelt forms and I did not intend for anybody to see them. They were just like what I needed to make while I was making these big carved forms. And, um, and then Bob Arneson, who was my, my friend, instructor at the time, um, was very nosy and went into my studio and found them. Like, they were behind <laughs> things. He seemed to know where they were. I think he went in when I wasn't there. But um, he found these, he's like, well, what's this? And I'm like, you're not supposed to see that. And he goes, these are powerful. These are really powerful. And I didn't get it at the time, because I'm like, no, you know. Anyway, that's how the work got really, I found my, pow my strength in something that was meaningful to me. Other than like illustrating an idea, I was making something that just was right. So, I mean, since then, I have, tr you know, I have gone larger, I've done other things, but I find that for me personally, like I found power in this small scale. And the other part of why, why have I been working small scale for 35 years? That's a choice. The choice is that um, this is how I, I, I feel like it's a little bit of a punk rock badass thing too, is like I don't think that I need to make something really large to yeah. say that something's really good. 
I don't feel like I need to take up a lot of physical space. I'd rather take up your brain space. <laughs> you know, I, I don't feel that, um, especially in, in environmentally, you know, honestly, like I, I don't need to have a large footprint. I think that I can say a lot and have presence in a very small space. And, and I know I do. Like, I, I know yeah. that like one of my small pieces can, can fill a room. And I, I, that's power, yeah. right? Yeah. So I don't, I don't need to, I don't need to scream. Like I really feel like these are whispers are so much more intriguing. Like I'd rather be whispered at and like come closer, and I want to stay there longer, like linger longer. That's like what I like to say. I like to linger longer with my works, but I don't need to be. Um, I don't need the work to shout at you. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's. I want to seduce you into my world. <laughs> Can we go to the next one? Mm -hmm. I think it might be... Oh, uh huh. Super green. So, okay. So, uh, I, I want to know sort of what's going to happen next in yeah. these works. But I think this is a really nice one to look at for us. There are a few different things in some of the headscapes that are just really interesting. One is the way that there are, you know, we talk about these works as painterly, and it's really in the headscapes that you see the painterliness, like you can see color fields, or, you know, almost like a gestural, um, you know, painting yeah. on the surface, even though it's glaze. And then the other thing that we had kind of talked about, mentioned a little bit earlier, but I think is really interesting, is the difference in the space. That the base is really not just kind of the, the thing that the important thing is on, but it takes up almost as much space yeah. in some ways, and it really becomes a part of the formal conceit of the work. Can you? Yeah. Yeah, when, when you first you know, said, oh, will you make new works for them? And they're going to be headscapes. And I was thinking, OK, they're all going to be these large forms. And then I have this thing when, like, given an assignment, I'm kind of like, no, now it's work. I don't want to do that. So I think. So then I just kind of worked intuitively. I was like, well, this is what I need to do. Yeah, they're 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 still headscapes, but they're not as big as I imagined. And um, so what I'm thinking these works are now are they're sculptural diptychs. So the the cube. Each one now has a cube. Yeah. And um, and at first I was like, well, I'm going to have a cube, and I'm going to like, you know, it's going to be the podium for the top form to speak. And then as I was working on them and developing them, I'm like, they're equal. And so now the, the cube needs to either work in tandem or, or have more of the voice than the top form, or, or um, they need to inform each other equally. And I thought it was gonna be easy, it's not, it's really? so difficult. <laughs> Cause like I'm working on some forms right now and I've made four different cubes to go with this piece. And it's just, I keep making different forms because it really changes the mood and, the, and where the piece wants to go. But anyway, so with this piece, what, um, what, what I'm going for in my work now is I wanna have the work have the same amount of impact with, um, I want to go a little bit more minimal. And so how do I, when I'm such a maximalist, yeah. how do I do that and have the same command and um, interest and pull you in? Um, how do I do that with, with less? And for me, it has to do with like the, the materiality and the, the physicalness of the application of materials and the buildup. I'm doing it in a different way. Yeah. And it's really hard to um, at first feel comfortable. Like I'm always, I'm like, can, can something be that simple? Well, it's really not that simple because they're fired a gazillion times. Yeah, and I was about to say there's, the, well, afterwards we'll look at um, black and white and you know, sure. that's another one where it looks like it's a monochromatic yeah. piece, and then you really get up to it, and you're like, oh my goodness, there's so much here. There are yeah. so many things under things with things. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. It's, 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 it's you can't it's, help it. It's my love of color, and it's my <laughs> love of, like, speaking about, like, being monochromatic, like, I just can't do one color. Like I need buildup of many colors to speak about a color, about monochromatic. So they're they're complicated, and 
and yeah, they're very complicated. Um, I, I don't know how to do something uncomplicated, so to try to make something look simple, it has to be complicated to, to look simple. I don't know if that makes any sense, but what, what, in, what, what, what was so interesting to me with this piece is that's one side and that's the flip side. And just how completely, I mean, they're the same palette, but how completely different they, they feel. So that's the other thing with what I'm doing is, you know, I, I really, um, I, paint, I, I think about painting all the time. I think of color and application and how it has to deal with the form. But what I'm dealing with is, in, rather than a flat surface, it's in the round. So yeah. every part of the work has to work and inform the other side or, or contradict the other side. But then it has to work as a whole. <laughs> So um, I really like the, how different these feel and look. And for me, that, that, that white area, it just, it, it, it's so dense. The white is so dense that it almost feels like a form unto itself yeah. when you look at the piece. So, so why I like this piece so much is because it's, it appears simple and it is sort of a, like a color block breakdown and it's something I had never done before. And for me, it really works without all the um, added detail. I mean, I love that. I, I, I go back and forth. I do a lot of added detail on, on certain forms and other ones I don't. But for some reason, like there's the, the nuance, like there's the white washy area on that yeah. part, and then there's the very dense white there. So I'm thinking of like, you know, opacity, translucency, buildup, sheer, like different ways of handling my my colors. And and you were talking before about like when you get larger, like you can see like there's a larger stroke. Like you don't know how excited I was to buy a big brush. Like I went to the <laughs> art store, I'm like, hi, oh, yeah, I'm buying a big brush. And it would just to go like this and yeah. have a gesture in a piece because I'm usually like this. So, oh my God. So that opens a whole new chapter for me. And that's like super exciting. So, you know, once again, like, you know, I imagine one would think like, oh, you only work with clay and glaze. Like that's boring. You're limiting yourself. But I keep finding there's so much interest. There's so much that I keep learning and finding and developing and yeah. Well, that was really, I know we're getting close to the time to open it to questions, but um, oh yeah. I just, <laughs> I, I need to have to put this one in because this work was so extraordinary. This is, um, again, a work when you see it, you know, you, 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 it draws you in because it is ostensibly a monochromatic work. And then these other colors and these parts start really kind of coming through yeah. the blackness of the object. And so it's, you know, it's all Easter eggs. <laughs> it's all Easter eggs, right? From the older work to the newer work, there's always something that is revealing itself. And it does, it really, it requires time yeah. of the viewer. And that is really powerful going back to what you said. Yeah. Okay, so the very last thing is, um, you said a little bit about this, but what's next? You put new works Oh, this. I did, I put. So um, we just have to see. Yeah, oops, wrong way. Um, okay, so this is a relatively like new work from like five months ago or, um, so, What I am so interested also that we didn't really discuss is like texture and how to, um, how to talk about color and form through like variations of texture. So with this piece, it is, it is a monochromatic um, crazy blue. I love the blue of the base and it's really <laughs> dense and intense and it was just a matter of building up glazes over and over again. And then, so that's a very dry glaze. And then the, the, the form on top started off all white. And um, oh, it was so hard to figure this piece out. But I, I really enjoy like the different surfaces. So there's this like really intense shiny area next to a dry area next to like, in terms of thinking about blocks of color, like that interior orange versus the, um, the teal blue of the base, like really thinking of blocks of color, but then flow at the same time. And then, you know, negative space within the piece and uh, like dirty areas and uptight areas. So these, this is where the work is going. So there's one, 
There's another one oh. from, from my last show. So trying to, like, this is an example of what I was talking about. Like, I'm trying to, um, I'm, I'm trying to, the work's getting more abstract to me in yeah. a strange way. Like, they're, they're more about, um, about density and, and, and form and color. I'm, I'm doing it in a different way. And it's really hard. Like you know, change it, changing is like really hard. Yeah. And but I'm trusting it, and I'm going for it. And um, you know, the scale shift between that like that little green cube on the top and the large green cube on the bottom. So like the way I'm finding tension in the piece, is, they're different. It's different now. So I never want to repeat myself. Like I think like I have a who doesn't have a really good bullshit detector, but like I know when I've done something twice and yeah. I'm so uncomfortable being comfortable that I, I, I have to, like, this is hard for me to figure out, but like, why do, why do I want it easy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think everyone will see if they haven't already in the exhibition that it is true that there are threads and there are similarities, but there are not two works. I, I mean, it is truly, changeable, movable, and they really do kind of sing in very different ways. So, so how, open it up and questions, anyone have questions for Kathy? <laughs> hey, hi, beautiful show. Thank you. Could you please talk a little bit? It's clear that you like to work with interiors and exteriors for reasons, but could you talk a little bit about what that has to do with a pot? With what? Pot, with a pot form? Well, it's just my, it's my form. It's, um, it's a form that I find has presence that can be very representational for a lot of things that interest me. So I don't, you know, for me, like, yeah, it starts off as like a vessel oriented form, but I'm not interested in utilitarian concepts for my work at all. Like I, um, for me, it's, it's my square, like the vessel form is my beginning. You know, everybody has, you know, some people are triangles or, you know, whatever, like that's my, that's my form. And I love that there's an interior space and an external space, and I can work with, I can choose to work with both. I can like hide the inside if I want, but it's accessible to me. So I think there is just also just historically, like we all know, like there's like, there's something like extremely special about like a vessel form. It is like representational of a life form. Um, so, for me, I think, you know, if you think of my history of, you know, just my work, like the vessel form has a deep meaning. And I don't, I don't know, it's just my, it's just my form. It's where, it's my start, yeah. Hi, it's really wonderful to hear about your work. This is a real Potter question. Um, you put so much time and work into the forms. Do you do any glaze sampling or do you just take what you know about the glazes and go forward on that piece and whatever happens, happens? I wing it. I don't, I don't, um, I, I, I have a ton, I have probably 5,000 jars of glazes that I've collected because I have a problem <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Um, it's one of the most beautiful things in the studio. You know, I have it's to like the glaze cabinet. Yeah, I have those Billy IKEA cabinets with glass, and my 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 studio is full of these beautiful jars from like very various years from like the 50s up till now. So I I collect glazes, and um, some of them don't even have a label, and so I do test. I test every. I just do a color sample of every color I have, and there's like a I take, I open up my magic drawer and there's like a, it's like a, you know, a palette of different yellows. Like there's like a whole um, drawer of yellows. There's a whole drawer of reds and that's the start, but I never test what does this color do on this color? How does this react? Because I'd never get work done. 
The, the, the tests are the, the works. And things go wrong, wrong all the time. And what wrong is, 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 a, um, is an entryway to a new thought process. So if I, you know, there's a lot of chemistry involved and I don't care about it. You know, I, I've been doing it for so long, I kind of know what's going to happen, but I really want things to go wrong so I can learn new things. So I do everything you're not supposed to do and it just kind of registers in my head. But I know if I'm really going for something, I try never to really just go for something. I just say intuitively, like, I'm going to put these two colors together and see if they work. A lot of times they don't work, and I fire it again with another color on top of it. So that's also why um, there's so many firings, is because it's, you know, I find the work. Like, I don't, I don't, um, I don't have an idea. I, I work with it and, and, um, and through the process of, of making an experimentation, the work has a voice and I, I find the work through the process. Your pots sometimes look like um, they're folded. Is all that looks like folds, is it all carved? Yeah. They're, it's they don't, amazing to They me. don't slump, like... You don't go like... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know some, uh, many people ask me like, oh, well, that happens in the firing. They slump and they, well, it's the process. So when I, when I start manipulating the form, the clay is malleable and I let it start speaking to me. And if I don't like what's happening, I'll prop it up and, you know, make it stand. But it's emotive. Like I'm trying to find a feeling in, in the form. Um, and then I, you know, been doing it so long, like if I don't want it to slump in the kiln, I don't let it. If I want it to slump, I fire it higher. So there's ways of, um, you know, you know your materials. And it's, it's a really intimate process. Like, you know, I, um, you know, pick up this jar of glaze. I'm like, oh, I was letting cadmium in that glaze. And you pick up this glaze. Oh, this is like a synthetic glaze. Like, you kind of know your materials so well, and you know what they're going to do chemically. Yeah. Because that's basically all I do is work. <laughs> and raise my, my kids and whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in addition to the, the form, I feel like the color is also super emotive. Yeah. And I was wondering, um, you talked about having really specific standards for what you let out into the world in terms of finished work. But when you're putting together a show, are you thinking about a sort of emotional narrative art? For the entire show? Yeah, do you call things based on that? No, you know what happens is I feel like the works, a body of work is a time capsule of their, 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 their making. So like a body of work will take a year. And um, in that year, like if I start with an idea, um, it changes, like for a piece, it changes and evolves. Uh, all right, so now I'm gonna correct myself. So the, the, um, the last show that I had at James Cohan Gallery, I did have a, a concept behind the idea, the, behind the show. And I don't think I've really ever fully done that the way I've done it this time. Yeah, it's, I thought it was going to make it easy, and it didn't yeah. make it easy. But um, so my concept for this last body of work, and it's also what I'm continuing now, is I wanted to basically because I'm I'm calling them like sculptural diptychs. Each piece always had a cube, and each piece always started from a fishbowl shape. So I always had fishbowl and cube. So that was my parameters. That was like my assignment that I gave myself. And I also gave myself the assignment of, <laughs> to make it harder, um, I'm not gonna make the forms all that interesting to me. Like I'm not gonna add, have a lot of like extensions and add-ons. They're basically, maybe there were two or three forms that had extension or you know like added like line form handle type. So I basically tried to keep the top form relatively simple. And then what my idea was, was I want the color to do all the work. I want to have a very sort of, I don't think any form was boring because I wouldn't do that. But I wanted to have each piece um, physically not be too different from the, the next one, slightly. Fishbowl, cube. And then through color, 
how do I find interest and how do I find meaning? It, it was really all, it was really about like the painting. So it really was like the, the gestures and the colors have to do all the work this time. Like you can't count on form as much as you have in the past. So that, is that kind of what you were asking? Yeah. Yeah, I, it was, I mean, I was specifically asking because I saw the show and I thought it was really great. Oh, you saw the show in New York? Oh, thank you, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, when you saw that show, and there's, there's a piece from that show in, in the gallery upstairs right now, and it has the really red, white, and blue, like really um, bubbling base cube. And um, that was a way of also having like, you know, a cube is a cube, it's a square. Like to me, like the, the reason I like to use the cube is it's a form, it's a form, it's a fact. Like I, it's just a fact, it's like, it's a cube. Yeah. And then how do you get <laughs> how do you get blood from a stone? How do you make a cube have emotion? And once it starts bubbling, it's emotive. So like it's a kind of a challenge like how yeah. do you get a, how do you get a square to be to speak Th yeah. through texture and color and yeah. We get that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Gorgeous work. Um, since you're so process intuitive, how do you know when you're finished? That is such a good question. <laughs> and I figured it out finally because I'm asked that question all the time when it doesn't bug me anymore. <laughs> and, no, it's, it's right though because I like, I'm obsessed with my work and how do you know? Like sometimes a piece will be done and I don't know it's done, but it's sitting on the shelf, like my eye level, it's sitting in front of me for like a month and I haven't touched it yet. That's one indicator. And then I, or it means I have to screw it up, you know? But once the piece stops like annoying me, like there's always something like, ugh, something's driving me crazy about that piece. Once it stops annoying me, and I've made it, we're on the same level, then it's done. Yeah. Or, or you get the opinion of somebody you trust. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Lisa thank and you. Kathy. This was a wonderful evening.